Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India welcome you uh, to the first lecture of this NPTEL MOOC course titled Psychology of Stress, Health and Wellbeing. Now, uh, so this is the first lecture of the first week and it is module number one. Uh, the module number one is titled as Stress, Its Nature and Physiology. So, in this module we will have three lectures. Uh, so, today we will start with the first lecture. Uh, the first lecture uh, here, I will give you an overview of this course very briefly and I will talk about nature of stress uh, first part. Now, uh, as the name suggests, this is a course of psychology and, uh, and it is specifically tailored uh, to understand the phenomena of stress, health and well-being and uh, interrelationship am among all these concepts. Now, before I go into go into the overview of this course, uh, let me give you a brief idea about what psychology is all about because many students uh, taking this course uh, may not be aware of psychology. So, I will just give you a very brief uh, idea about what psychology is all about so that you can understand uh, what is this discipline is, uh, uh, what are the contents of this discipline. So, one of the uh, basic definition of psychology is that you know psychology is the science or scientific study of behavior and mental processes. So, there are three terms we need to understand uh, one is scientific study, one is behavior and one is mental processes. Now, psychology claims to be a scientific discipline you know what is the meaning of a scientific study or scientific discipline. So, any study, uh, any field of study that uses a uh, scientific method for seeking knowledge or gathering information, it can, can be called as a scientific discipline. So, uh, scientific method is the key, key term. So, we have you know pure sciences such as physics, chemistry, biology, we have social sciences such as psychology, sociology, etcetera. So, the idea is all this discipline uses scientific method to get information and uh, you know basically to seek truths and knowledge uh, in the area of that discipline. Now, scientific method seeks truth through observed evidences and not through you know uh, authority, ideologies, tradition uh, where you know it can be very subjective knowledge. So, it tries to seek knowledge through observed evidences. Now, to be truly scientific, you know, there are uh, certain hallmarks of scientific study, you know, to be truly co called some discipline as scientific study, uh, there are certain characteristics which are very important. So, one is obviously a uh, systematic observation. So, systematic observation basically means, you know, uh, the observe, it seeks knowledge or information using systematic observation that means it is not using selective or random observation. So, when you conclude something based on selective or random observation you know it can be biased it may not be true. So, scientific method uses systematic observation to come to a conclusion. Empiricism the idea of empiricism is another important term that is used in the context of scientific method. Uh, empiricism basically means when we seek information or knowledge uh, using you know our sense organs. So, that is related to our observation. So, we seek knowledge uh, using our sense organs. So, scientific uh, method or science will not study anything that is not detected by using our sense organs. Uh, so, science will not talk about something you know uh, beyond observation of our sense organs. So, paranormal, mysterious thing probably. 
So, those uh, empiricism basically means that it can be observed using our sense organs or detected using our sense organ, five sense organs, either directly or or by enhancing using our certain instruments methods such as telescope, microscope, etcetera. Another important uh, characteristics of science is objectivity. Now, uh, we all have many biases within us and those biases may kind of create an obstacle while uh, seeking information or knowledge in any area of discipline. Because I may s personally think some information or some ideas r as right which may not be right simply because I personally think so which is my subjective interpretation. So, objectivity is basically in the in the pursuit of objectivity basically researcher find ways to gather information that are not influenced by their own biases or subjective biases. So, objectivity makes you know it helps you to collect factual knowledge and subjective knowledge basically you know changes from person to person depending on his ideas and biases. So, at least uh, in the scientific uh, method the researchers tries to minimize subjectivity and maximize objectivity. This is very important characteristics and uh, the third characteristics of scientific method is replicability or verifiability which is very important because uh, there is no foolproof ways for social sciences particularly which guarantees you know pure objectivity in terms of gathering information that is why verifiability is very important. So, that is why people publish research in the journals so that you know people can use those methods and verify your findings whether they are true or not. Well, if you just find out something and no other people is able to find out the same result using those same method then we cannot call it as truly objective or truly uh, as a part of the discipline or scientific uh, or science. Uh, so, replicability is very important it has to be verifiable it has to be replicable by using whatever method you have used. Then only we can call it as a kind of true uh, factual knowledge and can become a part of scientific discipline. So, uh, these are very important characteristics of scientific discipline. So, when we say psychology as a science scientific study with the idea that psychology tries to use all these uh, characteristics to gather its information and all the contents that we study in psychology are basically uh, are concluded using those scientific methods. Now, psychology studies behavior. So, behavior basically technically we use this term uh, in psychology to understand or to mean basically uh, any actions that are observable and that can be measured. So, all the actions that we can see that a person is performing action, you know, whatever, you no know, speaking, walking, whatever it is, all the observable actions uh, which can be measured using some method, you know, all these are called as behaviors uh, in psychology. Mental processes is a broad term which basically includes diverse activities of human mind uh, such as perception, thinking, memory, imagination, etcetera, etcetera. So, all these are collectively called as mental processes and psychology tries to understand all these mental processes, behaviors. Uh, psychology also looks into human emotions and uh, how it is influenced by our thought processes, etcetera, etcetera. So, briefly if I want to say psychology is a discipline that tries to study uh, diverse aspects or dimensions of human behavior, mental processes. Uh, so, since it is a very complex field of study, uh, mm -hmm. this uh, discipline is a multifaceted discipline just like other disciplines. So, it has many sub branches. For example, we have clinical psychology that looks at uh, mental disorders and treatments. Then we have organizational behavior which uh, looks at how human behave in the group situations or the, in the organizational situations. Uh, then we have social psychology. Uh, which looks at you know uh, human behavior in the context of social settings. So, so we have many such sub disciplines within uh, psychology to understand uh, specific areas uh, of human behavior. So now uh, 
as we have already uh, as i have told you that this is a course of psychology specifically tailored to understand uh, stress health and well-being so let me give you an overview of this course so this course will systematically address the issues related to uh, psychology of stress health and well-being in the initial level you know this course will uh, discuss uh, the concepts of stress health and coping processes how we experience stress and how it is related to human mental and health, physical health and what are the coping processes how can we cope with different uh, difficulties of our life stressful situations of our life so specifically we will address following questions in this initial you know uh, few sections such as uh, what is the mechanism by which our mind creates stress so we'll try to understand deeply how what are the mental processes by which we create stress in our mind then we'll also look at uh, is there a connection between our mind and body uh, can stressful experiences cause physical diseases such as heart disease can stress influence our immune system so basically we we'll look at how stress is connected to physical health so this is also very important we will see uh, the mind body interaction in the context of stress we will also uh, discuss are there any positive dimensions of stress so we will also look at is stress always negative or there are many positive aspects to it we will also look into those aspects uh, we will also uh, discuss what are healthy and unhealthy coping strategies for stress management. So these are also very important. Uh, we use many coping strategies in our day to day life. Some are healthy, some are unhealthy. So we will look into all these aspects and we will also address are there any evidence based coping strategies that can be used by us. So we will look into many healthy coping strategies that we can use in the context of stressful situations, traumatic situations. In the next level of this course, uh, we will discuss what lies beyond stress and coping paradigm. So, we will not just talk about stress and coping, we will also talk about uh, ideas which are beyond stress and coping uh, paradigm such as positive mental health, happiness and well-being will be discussed in this course also. So, the psychology of happiness and well-being fills these gaps in the area of stress and health by providing understanding how can we move beyond managing stress and achieve greater sense of happiness and well-being and a flourishing and a meaningful life so in this connection we will try to address some of the important questions such as what is happiness what makes us happy do we really know what makes us happy so these are very important questions that we will address in this course we will also address questions such as can we become happier what are the barriers in achieving sustainable happiness? Is it possible to become happier or can we increase the level of our happiness? So these are the very important applied questions that we will address in this course. We will also see are there any evidence based happiness enhancing strategies, activities or intervention that we can apply in our life to increase the level of happiness. We will also address you know is happiness sufficient for our well being or should we look for some other aspects also other dimensions of human well-being such as meaning and purpose in life so all these aspects we will uh, discuss in this course and uh, i believe uh, uh, this course will be a very applied and interesting course for all people who are interested into their health happiness and well-being so we'll try to make it uh, as applied as possible so that we understand uh, various important aspects of our life so now we'll formally start the content of this course so the first concepts that we'll discuss in this course is the nature of stress so we'll talk about nature of stress in two lectures so i'll I will talk the nature of stress first part today and the next lecture will talk nature of stress second part uh, in the uh, next lecture. So 
some of the key concepts that we will discuss under uh, nature of stress. Uh, key concepts are why stress related problem is a global epidemic, why is it important to understand the dynamics of stress in our life, what is psychological stress. So, this is very important you know in order to understand uh, you know diverse aspect of stress first we need to understand the definition of stress. Uh, we will also look at what are the mental processes involved in the stress response. So, how our mind creates stress. So, we will try to understand and address uh, in this lecture and also uh, we will look at what are the different characteristics, types and sources of stress. Uh, this we will address in the next lecture. So, we will I will start with one question on that have you ever experienced the following symptoms before or after an event such as forgetfulness, confusion, inability to concentrate, constant worrying, irritability, moodiness, loneliness, isolation, sleeping too much or too little, eating more or less, procrastinating, excessive drinking of alcohol or smoking or drugs frequent cold, headache, chest pain etcetera. So, if you have experienced some of these symptoms, uh, one most important possibility is that you are experiencing stressful events in your life. So, as a response to stress mostly we experience all these symptoms or some of these symptoms. Uh, now, we will talk about stress as a global epidemic you know. Now, WHO dubbed stress as a health epidemic of the 21st century simply because you know uh, this is a global phenomena and it is constantly arising. At present as we know for example, you know COVID is a pandemic where it is a global phenomena. So, similarly stress is a global phenomena and it is rising everywhere. So, it is not just a local phenomena. So, that is why it is kind of dubbed as global pandemic because uh, its influence is everywhere, its influence can be seen everywhere. So, there are uh, many uh, st staggering statistics available in terms of rising stress and its implications in various countries. So, I will just uh, discuss few of them. One is in the context of America stress is estimated to cost around 300 billion dollars per year and there is an increase in the stress level of about 10 to 30 percent between 1983 to 2009. So, this is one of the statistics which shows how rapidly it is increasing and how much cost it is you know a country has to bear because of this rise of stress level in terms of its impact on health and well being of the people. So, we will look into all these dimensions in more detail. Uh, in the context of India Recently in 2019, a global well-being study conducted by Cigna Corporation, uh, it reported that about 82 percent of Indians are suffering from stress on account of work, health and finance related concern, which is uh, higher than other developed and emerging countries such as USA, UK, Germany, France and Australia. So, this is in the context of India, the situation is also very bad and uh, in some context it is much more than even developed countries. Now, there is a huge consequences of such rising stress uh, in terms of its devastating impact on multiple dimensions of our life such as health, well-being and our functionings of our life. So, it has negative impact in our health, our well-being and functionings of our life such as physical health, mental health, performance, productivity quality of personnel and social life etcetera and it is accounting for a significant burden of disability within nations. So, uh, there can be many reasons for such rises and there can be uh, you know uh, some local reason, some specific reason connected to a person's life, but in general you know one of the major global reason is. Uh, rapidly changing world you know our world is rapidly changing and it is causing uh, disruptions and you know any disruption and changes 
forces us to adjust to the new environment and adjustment causes some kind of and such changes uh, forces us to adjust and experience stress. So, those rapid changes can is happening everywhere even at our lifestyle level of, of our job level at the, our global level you know it at our society level. So, at, the, at many all the levels there are rapidly changing uh, situations that we are encountering and uh, such changes forces us to adjust to this new environment and stress is a natural consequence of such changes. But obviously, there can be you know individual uh, you know, specific reasons for stress and so many things. So, this is but one general reason that is you know why globally it is becoming a pandemic, a kind of global epidemic. So, therefore, it is very important to understand the dynamics of stress in our life because it has far reaching implications in our health, well being, our functionings, or quality of life. So, without understanding these dynamics of stress in our life, we will not be able to lead a productive and flourishing life. So, to lead a productive and flourishing life, we need to understand all these dynamics of stress. Therefore, it is important to understand and reflect on all these issues. So, this particular course, we are basically trying to understand that from the from going through the literature of psychology and how what psychology has you know understood about stress, health and well-being. So, we will try to understand all these diverse aspects throughout this course. Now, before we can really understand the diverse aspect of stress, we need to understand what is stress. Now, stress is a very commonly used word and may mean many things to many people. So, if you look at uh, the literature of psychology, obviously, you know, in order to understand stress in and its implication, it is important to understand what is the meaning of stress when we discuss it in the field of psychology. Now, there are many uh, definitions even within the psychology also about the stress. So, all these definitions can be categorized into three broad categories. One is called as stimulus based definition of stress, second is called as response based definition of stress and third is called interactional definition of stress. So, we will try to understand what are these three categories of stress definitions. So, first is a stimulus based definition of stress. So, stimulus is any external event person or circumstances that causes a reaction within us. So, any external situations, event, things that causes a reaction within us can be called as a stimulus. For example, now you may be looking at your mobile screen or computer screen. So, that is a stimulus because it is kind of causing some react internal reactions. Uh, you are thinking about something or you no, know, it is stimulating some thinking processes, thought processes. So, stimulus based definition of stress basically you know defines stress as an environmental stimulus which causes a strained reaction in the individual exposed to the stressful situation. So, here stress is defined as a stimulus as an external stimulus that causes a strained reaction within the individual. So, external stimulus is seen as a stress which causes a strained re reaction within that person. So, for example, you know uh, if you are stressed by an upcoming examination, so examination will be kind of considered as a main agent of stress. So, here stress will be looked from that external event. So, this type of definition came from basically because these are mostly at the initial level, uh, these were these definitions were popular and it came from the uh, disciplines such as physics and engineering where a substance is said to be under the stress uh, when the external load produces a distorting force inside the substance called strain. So, such kind of definitions were you know popular in the science such as physics and engineering disciplines. So, from there psychology also borrowed such definition of stimulus based definition of stress. So, here stress is primarily used, viewed as a demand from the external environment. One such definition was given by Simmons in 1947 
he defined stress is that which happens to the man not that which happens in him it is a set of causes and not a set of symptoms so this was the idea and it was mostly at the, the initial phase of research uh, such definitions were popular and primarily because they were borrowed from the physics and engineering discipline however such discipline uh, such definitions are no longer popular uh, primarily because uh, this definition is very narrow and limiting so we'll see why it is narrow and limiting in the other categories of definitions another uh, set of definition that came which uh, can be collectively called as response based definition of stress now a response based definition of stress is kind of looks as stress as a response within that individual and not as a stimulus as it was conceptualized in the stimulus based definition so response based definitions focus on the response to the stressful stimuli as the actual stress itself so that response whatever that response that happens as an external stimuli stress is considered as that response the response is primarily viewed in terms of physiological response so in those definition primarily the response was seen as a physiological response was what happens to your body at the physiological level so heartbeat increases you know some chemical changes happens so all these were primarily looked at as a response in those definitions so one of the most popular definition of this category was given by hans selye in 1974 he was one of the founding researcher you know in the area of stress he defined stress is the non specific response of the body to any demand made upon it so he said stress consists of no response of the body non specific response some general response that happens to your body as a as some demands are made from an external environment uh similar to stimulus based definition a response based definition of stress are also no longer popular uh, primarily because they are also limit limiting and focus is narrow then we have the third category of definition of stress uh, which are called as interactional definitions of stress here uh, it is a kind of combination of both stimulus based and response based definition and uh, it defines stress uh, as interaction between the person and the environment stress is an outcome of interaction between the person and the environment so it is neither seen as a stimulus nor seen as an only response it is more like an interaction between these two is a result of interaction so one of such popular definition uh, in this category is proposed by you know richard lazarus and susan fockman in 1984 which is one of the most cited definition of stress it defines stress is a particular relationship between the person and the environment that is appraised by the person as taxing or exceeding his or her resources and endangering his or her well-being so the basic idea is stress is here seen as an uh, kind of interaction between the person and his environment and when that person interprets the environmental situation as taxing or something that he will not be able to deal with then stress is the response that happens as an result of this interaction so this definition is more process oriented and it accounts for the dynamic nature of stress not just a static concept of stress so nowadays if you see in the literature of psychology the stress the most popular definition of stress are basically interactional definition of stress so these are uh, uh, you will if you define see stress definition of stress in psychology it will be mostly from the interactional perspective and it is the most popular definition and most accepted definition in the at present now this perspective look at stress as subjective phenomena simply because it includes interpretation of the event so it is a subjective phenomena uh, because of uh, individual uh, you know interpretation is involved in it now so so let us just uh, kind of summarize that and so when we conceptualize stress or talk about stress in psychology we are typically 
talking about stress as the experience or the condition that results when we interpret or explain a situation being more than our coping resources can handle so whenever we interpret a situation as something that is more than our ability of coping resources or more than uh, or it's not more than our coping abilities so stress is a result of that so whenever i interpret that i will not be able to deal with the situation uh, that situation becomes stressful for us so that is the basic idea of stress so stress is kind of when perceived situation is considered as a greater than our personal coping resources so this is the basic idea of stress when we talk about it in psychology now one of the aspect we have already talked about is that stress is a subjective experience simply because uh, a given situation can be stressful for one, one person and it may not be stressful for another person so if you put let's say five person in a particular stressful situation some individual may experience high stress some may feel low stress some may not feel stressed at all why this individual differences is primarily because these individuals are interpreting the situation differently so that is why it is called a subjective you know response or subject uh, it is a result of subjective interpretation so for example appearing in an examination can be stressful some for some student and it may not be that stressful for another student it depends on how that person is or that student is interpreting the examination if he thinks i am well prepared and uh, i can do well it will not be that stressful on the other hand if a, situ a student interprets examination as something which is you know he will not be able to uh, you know score good marks because he is not prepared then it is more likely to be stressful so this difference is coming because two students are interpreting the examination differently so we are stressed by different kinds of thing uh, and there is nothing wrong or bad to feel stressed in a situation when someone else doesn't so if someone else is not feeling stress in a situation and i am feeling stress there is nothing wrong in it because it all depends on that person's interpretation processes uh, and uh, because another person is not experiencing stress in a situation simply because it that situation is not relevant for that person and it may be very relevant for me that is why i am experiencing more stress so all these individual differences may be there when we talk about stress so what makes something as stressful the amount of stress each person experiences depends on his or her understanding belief about a situation or event so when we interpret a situation obviously it depends on many things uh, our understanding of the situation our beliefs about the situations all this will influence uh, the stress response and our interpretation process so different things are stressful for different people largely because the meaning of the event differs from person to person people have different resources available for dealing with a stressful situations so one thing is obviously interpretation of the situation itself and another thing is interpretation of how much resources you have to handle a situation so we we'll look into that part also so it, uh, so this interpretation processes are very important in um, most of the situation you know uh, uh, this interpretation process could be very uh, it could be unconscious and automatic you know because of our habits past habits so you see see a situation and automatically you experience stress because those interpretation could be very ingrained in your mind unconscious mind and it can be very automatic uh, and unconscious and habitual so many time you may not see all this interpretation going on in your mind simply because it is happening very fast and uncon at the unconscious level so there is a good news in that simply because you know if stress is happening because of our interpretation process one thing is that we can change that interpretation process so uh, we look into how we can change all this interpretation processes in the coping section when we discuss coping strategies now 
cognitive appraisals of stress. So, this is the next concept. Basically, as we said, stress depends on our interpretation process. So, cognitive appraisals basically means assessment or interpretation. So, we will see little bit more detail in little bit more technical ways how this interpretation happens and what are the different types of interpretation uh, that happens when we experience a stressful situation. So, appraisal of stress explains how different individuals have different reactions. So, as we have already seen or uh, try to understand that different people react to same situation in different ways. So, uh, cognitive appraisals can explain these differences. Some uh, people you know may find an event as stressful, others may find it exciting and some other people may, may be unaffected by an event. So, all this diverse reaction can happen. Same situation may be very stressful for one person, it may be exciting for another person, it may not be uh, or a person may be unaffected by that same situation. So, it all depends on that individual differences. For example, you know uh, giving a public lecture or, no? or public speak, speaking. So, if you want to give a speech in front of people, it could be in the schools or it could be in any other forums. Some individual may find it very stressful event simply because you know he is interpreting public speaking as a threat. Uh, because you may th think that I may not be able to speak properly, I may fumble, I may you know or what others will think about me. All this interpretation process will make uh, this public speaking event for one person very stressful. The same event another person can see it as an opportunity uh, or as a challenge to grow or challenge to show one skill and he may feel excited about it. So, this can happen. Uh, so, all this diverse reaction can happen and it is happening because of all these differences in the appraisal of the event. Uh, Richard Lazarus uh, gave a model of details model of this interpretation process or appraisal. So, we will just look into that. So, Lazarus and Falkman 1984 they proposed a three cognitive appraisal process in the stress uh, reaction model and they said there are three process appraisal process one is primary appraisal one is secondary appraisal and third is reappraisal so what is primary appraisal in the primary appraisal here basically people judge a particular event or situation as either positive or negative so at the initial level whenever you encounter a situation so we judge that situation as positive or negative so that interpretation is called as primary appraisal now, this primary appraisal can in the in the process of primary appraisal uh, a situation can be judged in terms of potential harm loss threat or challenge so particularly when we interpret a situation as stressful uh, you can interpret a situation as either irrelevant it will not have much influence on you when you interpret a situation as irrelevant for me uh, or you interpret a situation as relevant but not threatening for you. So, for example, you know I said examination. So, you are fully prepared for it. So, it is relevant for you but it is not threatening for you because you are fully prepared for it. So, it, it will not be that stressful. Then when you experience or interpret an event as stressful particularly because an event becomes stressful when we make judgment in terms of harm loss, threat or challenge. So, these three interpretation particularly is associated with stressful experiences. So, harm loss basically uh, is appraisals of primary related to past experience and the present experience. When you see some kind of loss or damage that is happening or has already happened because of an event. So, it could be losses in terms of loss of money, job or even psychological loss such as self-esteem, loss of self-esteem. So, you may when harm loss interpretation is there, stress is a natural outcome. Threat appraisal primarily happens and it is mostly future oriented interpretation. So, when you uh, see a future possibility of harm loss, you know, uh, 
uh, then it is called as a threat. For example, uh, there is an upcoming presentation for you in your organization or in your job situation and you may see uh, it is a very threatening uh, event simply because if you see interpret it that a bad presentation may lead may hamper his future possibility of promotion then it will be a threatening event for him challenge appraisal is very different actually here basically you know person see a possibility for growth and gain from a situation so i see it as a challenge simply because i see it there is an opportunity for growth in that area so it is not so easy but it is not impossible also for me so there is a challenge here but it will help me to grow so it is not typically stress in that context but you know uh, it is more in the positive direction because it motivates people in the right direction so threat appraisal generally evokes negative emotions such as anxiety fear and anger but challenge appraisal evokes feelings of excitement eagerness and exhilarations so there is a kind of positive aspects to challenge appraisal also now uh, the threat and challenge appraisal may differ depending on the personal characteristics of the person sometimes you know people with low self esteem may see even promotion as a, a positive event such as promotion as a threat because he may think i if i get promoted will i be able to deal with the newer demands of that job whereas other persons may see promotion as opportunity for growth and you know show one's capabilities etc so it depends on personal uh, you know what what kind of individual you are what are the what are the thought processes mm, that you kind of use in a particular situation then comes secondary appraisal so one after the primary appraisal when you judge the situation as positive or negative or stressful then the interpretation happens you know whether you have the necessary resources to deal with that situation so that is called as secondary appraisal uh, evaluation or assessment of your resources when i say resources i basically mean do you have the necessary skills to deal with the situation do you have the necessary you know um, support system in terms of social support uh, to deal with the situation do you have the necessary material resources such as money to deal with the situation so all these are called resources so then you interpret do you have the necessary resources to deal with that situation so secondary appraisal is about that for example in an interview situation uh, uh, once you see that it it can be a threatening situation then after the primary appraisal uh, you may judge do i have the necessary skills to face an interview do i have the necessary knowledge about the subject or communication skills to appear you know or give a proper interview so if you have all these skills probably will feel much less stress as compared to somebody who thinks uh, he has no he is having uh, not enough of these skills so coping processes will be again discussed in detail in the upcoming lectures uh, then stress reappraisal is the third process where a you do reassessment based on the ongoing feedback from the situation which may have further consequences so during the event or after the event you do reassessment how you have done in that situation so that is called as reappraisal again making an appraisal of what happened based on the feedback from the situation so this whole three processes can be diagrammatically shown like this so let's say it is a using an example of public speech so primary appraisal you just judge this event of public speaking uh, whether it is positive or negative so in the primary appraisal you may say uh, it is not a problem because i have given many speeches before so you will not be feel that stressed but let's say in the primary appraisal level you say i have never given a speech before i might freeze what will happen i don't know so you are kind of interpreting that situation as threatening so it is more likely to have stressful consequences so in the first part you know uh, because you uh, you are in the secondary level you can say there is no threat because uh, i have the necessary skills to and the knowledge to talk about it so in the secondary level also there is no issue so in that case there will not be much stress however in the 
second case where you have interpreted is a threatening event. Uh, in the secondary level, you may s interpret that I may mix up words and lose track. I am not skilled enough. I don't have the necessary skill to uh, give a public speech. Uh, so it is again likely to increase the stress. And in the reappraisal, again, you may say, for example, the speech did not go well, but at least it is over now. So you may feel a little relaxed because how you are assessing based on the feedback, reassessing again or you may st stress may still continue when you may say I did not do well ne next time I will have to practice more so that you know it does not happen similar thing does not happen again. So all these things may happen at the reappraisal phase based on the feedback of the situation how you are assessing again and based on that there may be consequences. So all these diverse assessment or calculations may take place consciously or unconsciously in our mind resulting in the stressful experiences. So you can do this small exercise next time when you experience stress probably you can look at your mind and observe what kind of primary appraisal, what kind of secondary appraisal and what kind of reappraisal you are doing as a response to that event. So probably you will become more conscious of all these processes and may find some relevance and connection with this model. So with this uh, I will end today's lecture. Thank you.